first fourth annual Preservation Week talk. <clears throat> and we're highlighting an item from Special Collections um, by sharing with you the approach to conservation and the treatment process. We've had conservators come in the past um, from North Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover to speak about the challenges um, in conservation in the past of Egyptian papyrus leaves from the Book of the Dead, uh, an Ethiopian manuscript, and last year we had two photograph conservators come um, to talk about uh, conserving over 70 different daguerreotypes from the 19th century. <clears throat> and this year we bring you the conservation treatment of what was essentially a semi-permanently folded, in inaccessible parchment papal letter from the 15th century. So I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, who was able to make it possible to retrieve the information hidden in that folded letter. <clears throat> Tara Huber has studied and worked in the field of conservation since 2009. She's worked as an assistant paper conservator at the Northeast Document Conservation Center since 2015 and has completed internships at the Walters Art Museum, the Newberry Library, the Boston Athenaeum, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Tara earned her master's in art um, with a certificate of advanced study in con art conservation from Buffalo State College and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Tyler School of Arts um, of Temple University. She's a member of the American Institute for Conservation and the Guild of Book Workers. Please welcome Tara. So first I'd like to thank you all for coming and to extend a special thank you to Michelle for inviting me to speak at Brown University for Preservation Week. Today I'll be talking about the history and treatment of a 16th century Google <coughs> bowl or letter in the collection at Brown University Library that was previously unable to be accessed by researchers due to its condition. I'll be covering a lot of information, but there will be time for questions at the end. First, I'll give you a brief background of this project and why it came to NEDCC from the Brown University Library. I will then provide some insight into what the document is, including both the historical context and the materials and techniques used in its production. I will then describe the steps I took to treat and house the document so that it can be useful to researchers at Brown in the future. The letter was gifted to Brown in 1996 by a local medical doctor, but no further provenance information is known. In fact, very little information about the letter was known at the onset of this project because the stiff parchment on which it was written was tightly folded a number of times. Since the letter could not be safely unfolded, very little of the contents could be accessed without causing further damage, and only a very basic catalog record was able to be created. Similar letters are used in classes on manuscripts and history at Brown. Michelle Venditelli, the preservation manager, the library preservation manager at Brown, brought this letter to NEDCC so that it could be unfolded and made safe for use by students and researchers. A papal bull is a letters patent or charter authored by the Pope, usually in order to grant or to clarify rights or approval. Sometimes they were addressed to a general audience, especially when written to establish some new practice. Papal bulls have been in use since the 6th century, but it was not until the 15th century that the term became official with the establishment of the register of bulls within the papal chancery. Bulls are named after the lead seal, called a bulla, which you can see at the top of um, this slide. And the name derives from lead belier, meaning to boil. This is a reference to the melting of the lead in order to form and place an impression on the seal. These seals were used to authenticate the letter as an official papal document and are looped through the bottom with a hemp cord. The heads of the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul are on one side, with the name of the Pope issuing the bowl on the other. These documents were written on papyrus until the early 11th century when they began to be written exclusively on parchment. The first line is written in elongated letters and includes the Pope's name, the papal title, Episcopus Servus Serveum Dei, which means Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, and the Incipit, which are the opening words of the letter. The document closes with a date, place of issue, and signatures. Bulls were not named, but they were identified <coughs> by the first several words of their Incipit and by the date. Brown's Papal Bull is a document from the pontificate of Gregory XIII, who was Pope from 1571 until his death in 1585. He is most famous for commissioning and establishing the Gregorian calendar, which is the one that we use today. This calendar was introduced with the Papal Bull Intergravisimus in 1582 and replaced the Julian calendar, 
which had been used since the year 45 BC. Various countries complied over time, but it was not until the 18th century that Protestant Europe adopted the ca calendar. For instance, Great Britain and the American colonies continued to use the Julian calendar until 1752. William Monroe, senior scholarly resources librarian at the Brown University Library, has taken a preliminary look at Brown's papal bull after treatment and has begun to transcribe the document. Thus far, he has determined that the letter is dated to 1580 and is addressed to a bishop whose name and city have not yet been ascertained. The letter concerns some privileges granted by the bishop to a man named Jan Baptista Fleming, whose name you can see highlighted there. Once the document is returned to Brown, transcription can continue and more will be known about the contents of the letter. Now I'd like to tell you a bit about the materials and techniques used to produce Brown's papal bull. The document was written on parchment, which is animal skin that has been dehaired, stretched, dried, and scraped thin. Parchment began to be commonly used as a writing surface in the West between the first century BC and the first century AD, although its history is much older than that. An apocryphal tale about the origins of parchment states that Egypt placed a trade embargo against the export of papyrus to the kingdom of Pergamon, an ancient Greek city in modern-day Turkey. Rising to prominence around 300 BC, Pergamon was a burgeoning center of learning with a library second only to the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. The embargo on papyrus export, which was the most common writing surface used at that point in history, was an effort to quell the advancement of Pergamon, its scholarship, and its library. And whether or not a papyrus shortage spurred the actual development of parchment, um, I'm sorry, Pergamon was in fact a center of parchment production in the Hellenistic world. The Latin name for parchment, which is pergamenum, is derived from Pergamon. Parchment superseded papyrus by the Middle Ages, and it was not until the development of movable type and the rise of printed text in the 15th century that paper became the preferred substrate for writing and printing. There's a single producer of parchment in the US named Pergamena, after the Latin word for parchment. It's a very small company owned and operated by the Meyer family and located in Montgomery, New York. In 2014, I went to a workshop at Pergamena where I had the amazing experience of producing parchment from calfskin and goatskin using a combination of traditional and modern techniques. And the, the photos following this slide were taken during that workshop. And actually, in the previous slide, you could see a pile of raw goat skin and um, goat calf and sheep skins ready for processing. So parchment can be made from any animal, but the skins of calves, goats, and sheep were most common. The first step in turning a raw animal skin into parchment is selecting flayed skins that are free from blemishes caused by skin diseases, parasites, and injuries. Young animals have thinner, more supple skins and produce the finest parchment. Hair color is also a consideration. <coughs> Animals with white hair have whiter skins, which makes writing more legible. Once suitable skins were selected, they could be preserved by salting or by drying out in the sun. When the parchment maker was ready to begin to process the skins, they were first rehydrated in running water for a number of days, which removed the salt and reconstituted the skin. The first step in parchment making is the removal of hair from the outside of the skin and the flesh from the inner layer. To fully understand what is happening, it helps to have a little familiarity with the structure of skin. Skin is stratified into three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. And this is a diagram of human skin, so certain features like the depth of hair follicles and the relative thickness of the layers is different from species to species, but the general structure is the same, or it's very similar. So to produce a thin, non-oily surface that is both structurally sound and will readily accept ink require, requires removal of both the epidermis and the hypodermis, leaving only the dermis behind. The dermis also has three layers, which contain many components, but mainly consists of a highly woven matrix of collagen fibers, which gives it structural strength. The dehairing process removes the hair, epidermis, and uppermost layer of the dermis. Fleshing removes the fatty tissue, muscles, veins, and arteries that make up the hypodermis. Incomplete removal of the epidermis and the hypodermis results in a hard, greasy, yellow parchment with hair remaining in the follicles and an inconsistent surface texture that's not ideal for writing. 
<coughs> the removal of the outer two layers of skins begins with a lime water soak. This was traditionally accomplished in open pits where the skins were stirred occasionally and left for a few days to several weeks. Here you can see Jesse Meyer Pergamena scooping hydrated lime into a rotating drum that constantly agitates the skins. The alkaline solution of lime swells the epidermis and dermis, loosens the fatty hypodermis, and opens the hair follicles. Once the skin is sufficiently swollen and the hair softened, it is draped over a half barrel or a beam, and the hair is easily pushed off with a dull, curved wooden knife. The more arduous task is flushing, which removes the hypodermis from the dermis. The flesh, fat, and oil glands from this bottom layer are carefully cut off with a sharp, curved knife. After removing the outer layers, the skin is then delimed by washing and running water for a number of days. Some of the alkalinity imparted by the lime remains in the skin, which is one of the reasons why parchment suffers less from acidic iron gall ink corrosion than paper, a topic I'll discuss more later. The wet skin is then stretched on a large wooden frame using clips and ropes to pull it taut. A dull, half-moon-shaped knife called a lunellum is held perpendicular to the skin and used to scrape it repeatedly. This helps to squeegee out the water and stretch the skin even further. The toggles holding the ropes to the frame are constantly tightened and adjusted to ensure maximum tension across the whole surface of the skin until it is completely dry. Maintaining tension during drying is one of the most crucial steps in parchment making. It causes the collagen fibers that are highly woven in the corium to get pulled in a parallel direction. This mechanical process is what causes the skin to dry in an opaque, stiff, and relatively flat surface. Parchment differs from leather because it is made purely by this mechanical process and not by the chemical alterations caused by tanning. Because of this, it is a very hygroscopic material and can easily distort from fluctuations and relative humidity. <coughs> Introduction of moisture to parchment causes the parallel tension the parallel tension state of the collagen fibers to return to the disordered state that they were in when alive. This causes the parchment to cockle and distort, or even in extreme cases, return to rawhide. When the skin is thoroughly dry, a sharp lunellum is then used to shave off any rema remaining flesh and to make the skin thinner. The parchment could be further prepared for writing by sanding it smooth with pumice, or as Jesse is demonstrating, with, bed, with bread that is actually baked with powdered glass, and it's baked like rock hard, so it's kind of like a sanding block. Calcium compounds like chalk could be rubbed into the surface to reduce grease and make the surface whiter. Pastes with various combinations of lime, flour, egg whites, and milk could also be used to smooth and whiten the writing surface. Here I am with my completed calf skin. Parchment making is a long and difficult process that takes years to master, but the work is very satisfying, and the finished product is a beautiful and resilient material. Making it myself helped me to appreciate the work that went into the parchment objects that I have treated, and also to understand the deterioration mechanisms that affect them. <coughs> the finished parchment is removed from the frame and cut into folios. One of my favorite parts about working with parchment objects <clears throat> is examining natural features in the skin that can reveal much about the animal it was made from and also how it was made. Some of these features include hair follicles, veining, skeletal marks, scarring, color variation, and axilla, which are semicircular areas of looser skin where the legs meet the body. On Brown's cable bowl, the thicker, slightly darker skin that runs vertically down the center indicates the spine of the animal and the growth pattern of the hair follicles away from the bottom suggests that the bottom of the document was closer to the head. An axilla area on each side shows where the legs were oriented. Combining that information can determine where the folio was cut from the overall skin. Here's a rough visualization. This is a calf skin, and it's, and it's of course much larger than sheep skin, but the basic shape is similar. You can see that knowing the direction of the spine, the placement of the head, and the location of two axilla on the document can help to determine where it was located on the animal, and perhaps even give clues as to how many folios an overall skin produced. Depending on the size and shape of the sheep, it seems likely that a second folio of parchment was cut from the tail end of the finished skin. This calf is kind of squat, but I imagine if the sheep was a little longer, they probably would have gotten two folios from it. 
I was able to identify the parchment as most likely being sheepskin, using several different clues. If the skin has not been thoroughly <coughs> scraped, the flesh side and hair side can be differentiated by the presence of bits of flesh or hair follicles on the respective sides. The skin is rather thick, and since it was to be written only on the flesh side, the hair side was left less refined. The prominent follicle pattern shows clusters of follicles, which is typical of wool sheep. Wool sheep, hair sheep, goats, calves, pigs, and other animals have subtle differences in their follicle pattern, but it takes a bit of practice to make a judgment call based on follicle pattern alone. Another indication that this is a sheepskin is the color difference between the flesh and hair sides of the folio. The flesh side is velvety and white, whereas the hair side is smooth and yellow. Wool sheep have very fatty skin, which helps support wool growth, and the grease that remains in the skin after processing oxidizes and yellows over time, not unlike how oil painting varnishes darken and yellow with age and light exposure. The final clue was some areas of damage on the hair side. Earlier, I spoke about how parchment is made from the dermis of the skin, and this dermis consists of a grain layer, junction, and corium. In sheepskin, the grain layer is very fatty and loosely connected, and the structural corium underneath is very thin. The junction layer that holds them together is also weak, and the two layers are easily separated from each other. Because of this, sheepskin has little integrity, and the layers can actually delaminate from each other. Here you can see an area where the grain layer has delaminated and begun to peel away from the corium. Now that I've discussed how skin becomes parchment, I'll talk about how a scribe goes about turning a piece of parchment into a handwritten document. In order to achieve neat handwritten lines and margins, the scribe would punch evenly spaced holes, called pricking holes, along the vertical margins of the parchment. This was done with either a stylus, knife, or rolling star-shaped device called a punctorium that works like a spiked pizza cutter. The scribe would then use a ruler to line up corresponding pricking holes in each margin and inscribe a series of ruling lines. The ruling lines in this letter were created with a stylus, which produced scored lines on the surface. Other manuscripts were sometimes ruled with ink, which was often red, or with metal point, which created faint gray lines. The scribe could then further prepare the parchment for writing by applying a variety of surface preparations, collectively referred to as pounce. Pounce can be chalk, ash, powdered bone, red crumbs, or pumice that is rubbed into the parchment to reduce greasiness, raise the nap, and whiten it. <coughs> Both sides of this letter show evidence of a white surface preparation, which is most likely chalk. Another step in preparation for writing was making the ink. This was typically done by scribes using their own personal formulations until commercial production began around the 18th century. This letter is most likely, writ most likely written in iron gall ink, which was the most ubiquitous writing ink used in the West from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. It is produced by the chemical <coughs> reaction of tannic acid with an iron salt to create an iron tannin complex. The four basic ingredients are gall nuts, which are a source of tannic acid, vitriol or iron sulfate, which provides an iron salt, gum arabic as a binder, and water as a solvent. Tannins, or gallotannic acid, are complex organic molecules that can be extracted from the bark, leaves, pods, and fruits of various plants, but certain gall nuts, like those pictured here, have a particularly high concentration. Gall nuts are growths created by parasites that puncture tree branches to lay their eggs. An irritant secreted by the hatch larvae causes the tree to produce a gall, which in turn provides nutrition and shelter to the larvae until they reach maturity. The holes you see in gall nuts are created by the fully developed insect chewing its way out of the gall. Tannins are also the chemical used for tanning leather and producing black textile dyes, so gall nuts were an important natural resource for a number of industries. Iron sulfate, often referred to as vitriol in historical sources, is a metal salt that is also commonly used as a mordant for textile and leather dyeing. The salt could be obtained from mines through various extraction techniques by dissolving iron and sulfuric acid or as a byproduct of alum manufacturing. Gum arabic is a water-soluble gum that exudes from acacia trees in Egypt, India, and Australia. 
It hardens into transparent, amber-like lumps, ranging in color from pale yellow to dark orange. It is also used as a binder for some paints, such as watercolors. In an ink, gum arabic keeps the insoluble pigment particles in suspension, makes the ink more viscous, improves its flow from the pen or quill, and binds the ink to the paper. To produce iron gall ink, the tannins were extracted from the gall nuts by mixing with water, macerating, cooking, or fermenting the galls. The goal was to hydrolyze the gallotanic acid in the tannins into gallic acid as thoroughly as possible. Gallic acid is what reacts with iron sulfate to produce iron gall ink. So the higher the amount of gallic acid extracted, the more of it will react with the iron sulfate, and the more stable the ink produced will be. This was sometimes done in wine or beer rather than water, as the higher acidity of those liquids helped to yield more gallic acid. Once the gallic acid was extracted, it was mixed with the vitriol and gum arabic to create iron gall ink. When the ink is initially prepared, it is a water-soluble, colorless, iron 2 gallate solution. As it is expo exposed to atmospheric oxygen, it oxidizes and darkens to form an insoluble, brown or black, iron 3 gallate. The fact that the ink becomes insoluble and permanent as it is applied to the writing surface made it unique among manuscript inks, and as a result was preferred for official documents because it cannot be easily removed or altered. Here you can see a correction made by the scribe on the papal letter where the ink was scraped from the surface of the parchment with a knife and written over. Sometimes entire documents were scraped away to reuse the parchment support. Documents on reused parchment are called palimpsests which means scraped again in ancient Greek. Once the parchment and ink were prepared, the scribe could begin to copy the text. This letter is written using a Gothic chancery script, characteristic of papal letters. Another distinctive feature of this script is the extravagant floral motifs, flourishes, and elongated ascenders that decorate the large initials in the upper line. I noticed with careful examination that the extended ascenders were not produced all in one stroke and are in fact a slightly different shade of brown than the ink that forms the letters themselves, implying that the decoration was perhaps added as a final step. In addition to the main body of text, there are annotations written in several other hands detectable throughout the document. Not only is the hand noticeably different, but the ink color is as well. And you can see some of those an annotations in the bottom right. Some other hands also appear as annotations on the back of the letter, such as this signature and date. I don't know the significance of the date, but 1586 is the year after Pope Gregory's death. The letter first had to be humidified in order to soften the stiff parchment so that it could be safely unfolded for examination. As stated earlier, parchment is a material that is very reactive to humidity. In this sensitive sensitivity can be taken advantage of with the proper techniques. Introduction of liquid water would cause parchment to shrink and distort drastically and ultimately revert to rawhide. Remember that parchment by definition is skin that has been prepared, scraped, and dried under tension. Therefore, moisture must be introduced slowly and indirectly. This can be accomplished through a humidification packet. The letter was placed between layers of a special fabric that only allows water vapor to pass through, but no liquid water, <coughs> using the same principle as Gore-Tex fabric in sportswear. Moisture was then introduced by placing dampened fabric-like material on either side of the protected letter and covering the whole packet with polyester sheeting. Water vapor then slowly traveled through the fabric and gently humidified the parchment over a number of hours. Once it was sufficiently softened, the letter was removed from the packet, unfolded, and placed back in until it was relaxed enough for a prelim preliminary flattening between felts under light weight. I'll discuss the flattening of parchment in more detail later. With the letter unfolded, examination of its condition could begin. The parchment was mostly in excellent condition, but had overall planar distortions from having been folded. There is very light surface soiling, which was mostly present on the portions that were exposed when the document had been folded. There were two large jagged tears with some associated loss. One extended through the text, and the other seemed to be the result of stress caused by the heavy lead seal. 
The seal itself and the hemp fiber cord were in excellent condition, with some flattening in the high points of the design. Part of the examination of any object on paper or parchment is determining the stability of the media, which in the case of this document is several different brown manuscriptings. A very small droplet of filtered water is applied to the media with a small pipette, allowed to sit for several seconds, and then wicked up with blotting paper cut to a small point. The blotting paper in media is then examined to determine if any transfer has occurred. This procedure was done on all of the inks, most of which were found to be insoluble. The dark brown ink on the back of the object was found to be somewhat sensitive to water, so extra care must be taken during treatment steps that will introduce moisture to, the, to that area, such as humidification and consolidation. Another aspect of media stability that must be determined is its adhesion to the parchment support. This is determined by lightly brushing over the media with a very fine dry brush and observing any movement or flaking of the media. The ink used to write this letter was found to be actively flaking in many areas, and in some cases, whole letters had already been lost. Iron gall ink corrosion is one of the major issues facing the preservation of paper and parchment manuscript documents. Chemical alterations caused by iron catalyzed oxidation and acid hydrolysis result in the degradation of both the ink itself and the support on which it is written. <coughs> if excess iron sulfate was added while preparing the ink, that iron or other metal impurities can catalyze the oxidative breakdown of the ink and parchment, leading to brittleness and loss. Acid hydrolysis is caused by the sulfuric acid inherent in the manufacture of the ink and can break down the collagen of the parchment at a molecular level. Luckily, parchment is naturally alkaline and is more resistant to this form of deterioration than paper artifacts. However, this document is written on sheepskin, which, as I mentioned earlier, is easily delaminated due to its inherently weak structure. The ink has catalyzed the oxidation of the corium layer, and both the ink and upper layer of skin have been lost in these areas. So after examining the object, um, there were a number of challenges and considerations ahead for the treatment. Namely, the parchment was thick, brittle, and had been folded, and will continue to re retain a memory of those folds, even after flattening, most likely. Also, the seal was in the way of flattening, so I had to figure out a way to flatten the parchment without flattening the seal into the parchment. Um, and also, how to store the seal in a way that it won't continue to pull on the torn parchment. Um, another challenge were the inscriptions that were on both the front and back of the parchment and inscriptions that were under that folded bottom portion. <coughs> and of course, scholars need access to all that information. Those signatures are really important, but the fold is also part of the format, so it can't be unfolded and left that way. So that became an imaging and digitization project or problem. Um, also, some of the ink was water sensitive, as I mentioned, and much of it was friable and could be disturbed by handling. So overall, the purpose of this treatment was to stabilize the condition of this object so that it could be used safely by scholars and students in the future. Photographic documentation of an object before, during, and after treatment is an essential aspect to recording its condition and tracking any changes it undergoes during the conservation <coughs> treatment. Before treatment began, the letter was photographed using a copy stand setup in both normal and raking illumination. Here you can see the front and back of the letter photographed under both lighting conditions. You can see how raking illumination is particularly helpful in capturing the fold creases and planar distortion in this letter. The first step in the treatment of the document was to reduce the small amount of dirt and soiling on the surface of the parchment. This was mostly present in the fold creases in the portions of the letter that were exposed when it was folded. Ingrained dirt and handling grime are nearly impossible to remove from parchment, and more importantly, are evidence of the object's history. Therefore, only loose surface dirt and heavier grime along the folds and margins was removed using soft brushes <coughs> and cotton swabs. Areas with media were only lightly brushed so as to not disturb the degraded ink. Once the parchment surface was clean, the next step was to consolidate the flaking ink. A number of natural and synthetic consolidants can be used for this purpose, 
but gelatin is the most common choice for media on parchment. Gelatin is a protein that is made by the hydrolysis of collagen, the main structural protein in skin, and is therefore very compatible with the parchment support. I used a highly purified photographic grade of powdered gelatin, which was weighed and added to filtered water. After allowing the gelatin to swell in the water, it was heated and stirred until it went into solution. I then added ethanol to the solution. Water has a high surface tension, which is lowered by the addition of ethanol. This helps the gelatin to better penetrate into the media and the parchment, rather than beat on the surface and possibly reactivate water-sensitive media. The friability or flakiness of the media was again tested before and during the consolidation process. This time, a stereo microscope was used to more thoroughly <coughs> observe the condition of the media, and I went through the whole document letter by letter. As areas of flaking ink were identified, they were consolidated with the gelatin solution in one of two ways. In some areas, the gelatin was carefully applied dropwise with a thin sable brush, but most of the degraded ink was consolidated with a fine gelatin mist created by a medical nebulizer. Mist application was generally preferable because large areas of ink were unstable and is much faster than the fastidious brush method. Also, the highly degraded ink could be easily disturbed by the action of the brush, and flakes of ink could be lost by the lightest touch. The brush was used only when the fine mist of gelatin was not sufficient to stabilize the ink. Some flakes of ink were standing upright, barely attached to the parchment. These were softened with gelatin and then lightly pushed back down into contact with the parchment using a small metal tool. After the gelatin was dry, the ink was again tested and reconsolidated as necessary. Before the tears in the parchment could be mended, the folded edges needed to be flattened and the edges of the tears aligned. In order to safely do this, the stiff, brittle parchment needed to be humidified again. The method used was the same as when un unfolding the letter, but rather than an overall humidification, moisture was only introduced to the areas with tears. Once the parchment was sufficiently softened, the edges were unfolded, aligned, and dried under weight. <coughs> Next, I began to prepare an adhesive for mending. I chose to use isinglass, which is a collagen-based adhesive like gelatin, but it's prepared specifically from the inner membrane of this swim bladder of sturgeon. Isinglass has several advantages over gelatin as an adhesive for parchment, namely its higher tack and lower viscosity. The higher tack of isinglass was needed to adhere to the relatively smooth surface of this sheepskin letter. Like gelatin, isinglass requires warmth to form a gel, so the mends that I place will not come undone during the final humidification and flattening process. Japanese paper is the most common mending material used in paper and parchment repair. It is both strong and thin due to its long fibers and does not discolor or become brittle with age. Japanese paper is generally torn into strips for mending rather than cut. This feathered edge makes the repair stronger and less visible. After the folded edges of the tears were flattened and aligned, the profiles of the more complex tears were traced onto a transparent polyester sheet. The Japanese paper was then shaped to cover the tears and extend onto the parchment for several millimeters around the tear. Warm ice and glass was brushed onto the shaped Japanese paper, which was placed over the tears and dried under weights. And I did each tear a small section at a time. Areas of blocks in the parchment were filled using methods similar to mending, but multiple layers of thicker Japanese paper <coughs> were built up until the fill was the same thickness as the parchment. Once it was mended, the letter was ready to be photographed by digital digitalization specialist David Joyal of our imaging services department. The high resolution images captured will serve as a digital record of the letter and as a valuable research tool. It will allow the letter's contents to be accessed remotely by researchers unable to travel to Brown and will also protect the letter from excessive handling. Digitization will also to help overcome a major challenge with accessing the signatures in the bottom margin of the letter. 
The parchment is tightly folded at the bottom, a feature inherent to its format as a papal bowl. Not only is the fold tight and the parchment stiff and brittle, but the seal's cord passing through the fold makes trying to catch a glimpse of the signatures even more potentially damaging as it actually passes through one of the signatures. Every time the cord gets pulled through the parchment, the ink could become worn away, and the large tears already caused by the cord could become even bigger. In order to open the fold so that these signatures could be digitized, the letter was placed in a humidification packet as before. Once it was sufficiently humidified, the bottom was unfolded, photographed on both sides, and refolded to maintain the original format. Once the photography was complete, the humidified letter was placed between felts and held flat by a thick sheet of glass. The glass was not placed over the bottom margin in order to avoid crushing the seal's cord into the parchment. Instead, two pieces of plexiglass were used to flatten the bottom portion, one on each side of the cord. Lead weights were placed on the glass and the plexi to keep the parchment flat as it slowly dried between the felts for over a week. The final treatment step was to tone the mends and losses so that they would be more visually integrated with the rest of the letter. I chose to use Gamblin Conservation Colors for this purpose because they have a solvent-based synthetic resin binder that is reactivated with isopropanol rather than with water, so they dry quickly and do not introduce moisture to the fill paper or to the surrounding parchment. Before inpainting directly on the fills, I tested the colors that I had mixed on pieces of the same Japanese paper used for mending and viewed the results on a white and a gray background. Here you can see the back of the letter before and after inpainting the large vertical tear. And mostly I was just trying to um, complete the R, the break in the R, and also um, sort of dirty up the mending pieces because they are stark colors as opposed to the surrounding parchment. Once the treatment was complete, the letter was again digitized in its final state, this time with the bottom portion folded. I also took my own after-treatment shots, replicating the conditions of the before-treatment photographs so that they could be easily compared. Here you can see the front and back of the letter before and after treatment in normal illumination. And here in raking light, you can see that the parchment retains a memory of its folded state, but it's overall much more legible and will be easier to mount and to store flat. The final step in any conservation treatment <coughs> is to create an appropriate housing so that it can be stored and handled without <coughs> causing further damage. When designing a housing, it is crucial to determine the end use and the storage of the product of the object. Questions to ask include, is it going to be on display? If so, for how long? How will it be accessed from storage? Will it be handled? By whom and how often? What are the environmental conditions it will be stored in? What are the conditions of any secondary location it may be taken to, such as a reading room or a classroom? I consulted with Bill and Michelle to answer these questions and get their opinion on the housing options I presented them with. They informally that the letter will not be exhibited, but it will be made available to researchers and will be used in classes on manuscripts in history of Brown. Because it will be used as a teaching tool, this letter will be accessed and handled by multiple people relatively regularly. The letter also will be taken out of library storage, which has a carefully regulated relative humidity and temperature, and brought into a classroom with a different environment. Also, both sides of the letter will need to be visible, since there is writing on both the front and the back. I spoke with Anna Jean, our very talented preparator at EDCC, about how she could create a housing to meet all of these needs. Our solution was to house the letter in a double-sided mat so that both sides could be viewed without having to actually touch the letter. The parchment is hinged many times around the perimeter to the lower mat using Japanese paper and wheat starch paste. This holds the parchment in place while also allowing it to expand and contract with changes in relative humidity and without causing excessive damage or planar deformation. Without causing damage or excessive planar deformation. <coughs> A recess was also cut into the lower mat to accommodate the heavy lead seal, which is supported by a polyester pouch. The seal no longer pulls on the damaged parchment and can be easily removed to view on both sides. 
Parchment is a fascinating and durable material that maintains its almost literal vitality for centuries after its creation. Not only has it carried millennia of Western and Near Eastern knowledge to us in the present day, but the study of its surface reveals much about the history of domestication, craftsmanship, and technology. This unique paper bowl can now be read, studied, and finally appreciated by researchers at student and students at Brown and Abroad. I'd like to give a thank you to Michelle and Bill for inviting me to speak here today and for helping me with this project, and also for my many colleagues at NEDCC who assisted at various points in this project. And I can now take any <coughs> questions you might have. Thank you. Um, you were talking about how you could get a couple of um, big pieces out of one animal skin. Mm -hmm. Is there something that was done with sort of the scraps around the edges? Um, there's a number of things that could be done with the scraps, but um, glue could be made from them. So, or as people call it, parchment size. So you could boil those scraps like how they would boil um, hooves and any you know other detritus from animal slaughter and and produce high glue, for instance, um, parchment size is similar. But you're right, like they wouldn't have, they would have definitely tried to use as much as they could. like a lot of work to get to that point. You didn't want to stop it. <laughs> right, exactly. And also, um, parchment scraps could be used, um, they would be twisted and used as like thongs as sewing supports, um, and also for the end bands and the head and tail of books. So there were other um, uses, and actually it's fine lining sometimes as well. Yes. I was late coming, but how long did it take to conserve that document? Um, from start to finish, so I, have a lot, I tend to be juggling quite a few documents at once, so it's hard to say, but um, like for instance, the consolidation was the longest process, and that took two solid days of consolidation. Um, but for the most part, like the actual active time of working on this and not just <coughs> gathering materials and researching, um, it was maybe 30 hours of work. Oh. Okay. So, not too bad. Yeah. It's a beautiful document. You did wonders. Oh, thank you. I loved looking at it. I love looking at it under the microscope, especially. That's my favorite part. Um, is working with things, or like really seeing the hand under the microscope, you get to appreciate all the small strokes that went into each letter that um, honestly you can't really appreciate otherwise. So that's an exciting part. Were there any mistakes that they crossed off or? Um, there, so there was the one area that I had zoomed in on where um, they had scraped, oh yeah, actually yeah. yeah, you can see it there. Okay. There were a couple small areas like that, that was the least successful one and most obvious, so that's why I chose to show it. Um, but for the most part, I'm sure there's plenty of mistakes in there that they just didn't correct. so good that they could do, they could quite readily you know calligraph a line without you know a, a, a ruled line there it wasn't technically necessary even for the majority of scribes um, but it was a way of making it you know like especially in this context very extremely regular but you look at many medieval manuscripts and there's no ruling they just were that good right that is what they did all day so <laughs> And also with the uh, with regard to early printing and paper, it wasn't that it was a preferable sur service. I mean, uh, we think of things like early printed books, Gutenberg and Incunabula, as something special. At the time, they were cheap. Uh, they were like the paperbacks of their day. In other words, the, midi the manuscripts were still in early printing what was important. It's just paper was less expensive. Like you take a deluxe Bible, it might take 450 animals to create that one book. Whereas, you know, the Fabriano paper mill or something in Italy, you know, could provide you the paper for multiple editions of a printed book for much less expense. So it was, it was cheap. <laughs> um, and over time, 
uh, it became more used, but it wasn't preferred uh, surface. I mean, uh, the vellum and calfskin and so forth were far superior for writings, uh, for uh, illumination, and, and everything. You know, I mean, it's sad loss of whatever. I mean, even human skin has been used for this stuff, so. Have you come across any other? Big bowls that you, that you worked on, did you? Um, I actually worked on a maple bowl just before this, right? Yeah, um, a month and a half before this, but it was from 1969. <laughs> <laughs> it was on parchment. Um, it was on, so this is a, a really thick, rough piece of sheepskin, mm -hmm. and this was on the finest, um, you know, possibly uterine calf skin. You know, it was, it was so, it was such fine calf skin that, um, to humidify and flatten it, so I would humidify it, and the second I would bring it out from the packet, it would immediately dry out, so I couldn't flatten it. So we actually um, pitched a tent, I mean, like a literal tent. Um, Jonathan, our registrar, brought in his family's tent. <laughs> and we pitched um, the wood, um, the uh, metal frame of it, and then we put polyester sheeting over it and put a humidif an ultrasonic humidifier inside there. So I did my humidification and flattening in this steamy little tent. Did you <laughs> take pictures of that? Was the, yeah, there are pictures of that. <laughs> um, you were like, you need to take a photo of this. Yes. <laughs> because, right, just the, from taking it from one thing wow. to try and, so, um, also that one had a seal, but I was doing a different method. Here I just was placing, um, glass on top of it with the wool felts on either side. But I was doing a method that's clipping and pinning, so it's really similar to the initial stretching of parchment. You put clips along all the sides and then pins into like a cork board, and then you can control the tension that way. Um, and just the amount of time it would take. You do it really quickly and you have help, but um, it was just immediately drying. Because it was as thin as paper. It was really, um, had a really beautiful silky texture too. It was a really nice piece of parchment. But it was really hard to work with. <laughs> but so yeah, that was also a paper bowl. And it also had a lead seal, much smaller. Um, and it had, rather than a hemp cord, it had a yellow silk cord, which I vaguely remember reading something that there's a difference um, between those two, but I don't remember what it is. But um, they either had silk cords or hemp cords. So maybe it's like a more important, like this document is, you know, permissions for someone for something. Maybe that's more of a grandiose <coughs> purpose. I'm not sure. It was in Latin, so I couldn't read it. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know how to phrase this question. The level of technical detail involved in the work you did. I wonder if that creates a misleading impression of the certainty of exactly how you would preserve the document. What I mean is that it sounds to me like underneath all the technical detail, there's this process of discovery and uncertainty, and that it's really like a, a work of improvisation. Am, am I right about that? No, you're absolutely right. And actually, this, this project was pretty straightforward, but a lot of my projects, I'll do one tiny step and then have to completely rethink everything because just the way things function is different. So I'm working on um, a daguerreotype case that has a picture of Dolly Madison in it, but the case um, is made to look like a book, so I'm treating it kind of like a book, but it's not. It's wood, the whole thing is wood, and it's gilt. Um, but every time I do one little thing, so I just like fix the spine you know, of it, and now like the whole treatment is different. And there was five steps in fixing the spine, and every time I did it, I had to change my whole idea of what was happening. So for this one, things went really well, and they, they went as expected. Um, but a lot of times, it's a constant readjustment, and you're never really cer certain that it's going to turn out like exactly the way you predicted. Well, thank you all so much for coming.